Hey everyone, if you're a fan of the show, please head over to MikeyOp.com and click the subscribe button. It's the best way to support us, and it's free. That's M-I-K-E-Y-O-P-P dot com. Thanks! Hi, I'm Mike Oppenheim, and you are listening to Coffin Talk, Interviews with the Living, a weekly podcast that explores how our views on death affect the way we live our life. This week, coming to us from Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, is a good old friend of mine, Mr. Brian Fallick. He is a parole agent for the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania now, but he's also a former artillery captain in the U.S. Army, and he served in Iraq. Also of acclaim is the fact that he's a rad dad of a six-year-old daughter. He also enjoys video games, shooting guns, and all-around nerdery. So say hello, Brian. Hello, everybody. Hello, Mike. How are you? I'm doing really good, and it's really cool to be talking to you on the phone on this. Um, I've actually wanted to ask you onto the show for a very long time, but as I say over and over again, I, I pace out my friends. So uh, it is your turn, and thank you. Hey, and that's fine. I've been patiently waiting, and I'm sure you're a very busy man. So. <laughs> well, uh, it's always good when it finally happens, and uh, you've, you've listened to the podcast plenty of times. So the first question we ask you is the same as anyone, which is, um, how old are you? Where did you grow up, and what generation, if any, do you consider yourself a member of? I am 38 years old. Uh, I was born in Massachusetts, and we moved down here to Pennsylvania, east side of PA, or Bethlehem. We're about an hour or so north of Philly. And then, yeah, I moved here when I was in first grade, went off to college, met you out in Pittsburgh, and then off did my Army stuff. And now I am back here serving the great Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Um, as far as my generation, you know, uh, you know, as far as my age goes, and I would definitely consider myself a, I guess I would make me a millennial, but I tend to, I guess, be on the, uh, the older millennial side of it, you know, like right at that cusp, I was born in 83. So I tend to have some millennial tendencies, so to speak. Yeah. I mean, we talk pretty much every day and I would say you're like on that side of it for sure, for as uh, from my perspective. But you are uh, you're much better at grabbing the sweet memes and uh, all that internet stuff than me. I don't even know how to say sweet memes. I'm just copying you. But like you glossed over a lot of years, so I do want to kind of like pick out a few things. Um, eventually, I'm going to get into whether or not you were raised religious. But I actually think the main thing I want to start with is you. Uh, I believe your father was in the military, but I'm going to let you answer this. But uh, how and when did you become interested in serving our country, and then? What exactly was the process that led you to actually serve? Sure. So yes, you're correct. My dad was in the army. He was uh, he was an artillery officer. He was stationed in Germany um, way back when uh, we were still, you know, on the uh, on the outs with uh, good old Mother Russia. And so he uh, his cannons that he was in charge of they were these big eight inch guns. Um, and they were actually nuclear capable. And so he would tell stories about, you know, how he would, they're driving through convoys, through the, through the woods of Germany, trucking nuke warheads in the back, how they get lost. And he told me this one story about how he literally had to do this Austin Powers 100 point turn through this little dirt road because it's dead ended. And he's got this gigantic convoy with all these big old trucks. And yeah, it was, it was a nightmare, he said, but you know, it was always stories like that, you know, and I, I probably watched a little too much Top Gun and stuff like that when I was a kid, but, um, I always wanted to be in the army. I always wanted to be in the military, um, uh, not necessarily the army. I actually wanted to be in the Navy when I was a kid. I wanted to be a fighter pilot. So, um, the, the journey to where I am now, yeah, we, uh. When it was uh, time to start looking for colleges, I knew I wanted to, like I said, be a pilot. You got to be an officer. So I was scoping around with my dad, different uh, colleges all all around that had uh, Navy ROTCs, and um, eventually settled on the University of Pittsburgh, where my freshman year I was the uh, in the Navy ROTC, and uh, the ROTC is the Reserve Officer Training Corps. Um, that's uh, one of the one of the ways that uh, someone would become an officer in the army instead of going to, uh, you know, West Point or, or Annapolis, the Naval Academy. Um, you can just go to regular college, and while you're taking college, you just take a bunch of army classes and do PT, physical training a couple times a week, and and all that. But anyway, I digress. So yeah, we got to Pittsburgh my freshman year. I was a uh, in the Navy ROTC doing the Navy thing, but uh, 
after my first semester, um, my grades were not stellar. Let's just put it that way. And uh, everyone, all the instructors were like, oh, yeah, you know, I was, being a pilot's pretty competitive. You know, you got to be top of the class in like everything. And then after having like a, a two seven, my freshman year, I was like, oh boy, I don't want to get stuck on a, on a submarine doing something I don't want to do. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I said, you know, whatever, I'm going to jump over to the army, see what they got, see if they got helicopters. That sounds like fun too. So, um, joined over to the army ROTC, did that whole thing for the last three years of college. And then graduated with a commission in the army but uh unfortunately i was not selected to be a pilot so i ended up uh doing artillery just like my old man so um i spent three years active duty uh as an artillery well hold on hold on let's slow down a little bit because i think for our audience um because it's all ages and we're not giving any time cues so i met you in college it was probably like 2001 2002 that would have been your freshman year right 2001, I was my freshman year. And so for the audience listening, I'm just going to a real quick history recap. Um, September 11th was this like random day in 2001. And um, right near Pittsburgh, a plane crashed as well as three other planes. And most of us were terrified. And I remember you being like in in this program and just be like, what? And then you still, you, you stayed in. You knew that George Bush, or our president, you know, at the time declared war against Iraq and you were still in and then you went and served. Is that all correct? That is absolutely correct. I remember very vividly I was, yeah, because it was uh, my freshman year, I'm two months into school and I walked into one of my uh, intro to something, intro to information science, I think it was, uh, the class. And uh, yeah, it was early morning and we were sitting down ready for class and our instructor, our te- instructor, our teacher came in and he was all shaking. And he was like, classes are canceled for today. Everyone go back to your rooms. And everyone just kind of looked around like, what? Okay, cool. Like you said, like with, with what happened in the aftermath of that with the president um, giving his address and, you know, declaring war and everything going on, you know, everyone going off to the East, the Mideast. And, you know, I, I still wanted to serve. I still wanted to do some pretty cool stuff, you know, and, you know, if that meant going to war, then, you know, hey, you know, that's what the military does. And I, I guess it was just one of those things where it was like, even though for a very long time, it was mostly just peacetime stuff, but, you know, that's always a chance. And, you know, that's just one of those things where it's like, well, you know, this is what we're going to do now. So, yeah. And I think, I mean, obviously it goes without saying, I'm going to say it anyway, because it's a podcast. It goes out to a lot of people. You're a hero. I mean, by my actual definition, I don't care what anyone else says. If you know there's a war or don't know there's a war and you sign up and enlist and then you go and you serve you're a hero in my book because uh you're the pretense of the military at all times is to protect our country and i'm a member of our country and so with all that said the reason i'm like directly asking you about this is this is a podcast about like death and whether people fear it or don't fear it and how it affects their life so what to what extent at that time was death on your mind? And I'm not talking about um, 9-11. We're jumping forward now to like, you're on a plane headed to Iraq. Yeah. So um, first off, I, I, I appreciate it. Thank you. I wouldn't necessarily consider myself a hero, but that is what it is. Um, but but I appreciate it. Uh, but yeah, as far as, you know, that just that possibility, I mean, it's, it's, it's always there. Everyone's always thinking about it. Um, you know, it's always in the back of your mind, you know, and anyone that says it's not, you know, I mean, personally, I'm just like, it's, it's there, you know, you're going to war, you're fighting this insurgency, they hate us, all they want to do is kill us. And we're going over there, you know, to try to, at this point, when I, when I got in country, it was 2006, uh, October, 2006. So, um, you know, the, the quote unquote war at that point was over and we were going in and doing more of the uh, security and helping Iraq, you know, become its own nation. You know, where we're trying to just scoot out all the 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 bad, the bad, uh, the bad groups there. Yeah, but if if my memory serves me correctly, that was actually the more dangerous time. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, you know. It, def- it definitely was not without its perils, but, you know, the, yeah, de- death was always something that was looming. 
and um yeah during we were i was fortunate uh the 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 area that we went into in iraq it was you know a ways north of baghdad we were at uh the, the pretty much like the big air base that you know Saddam would use. It, uh, it was called LSA, Logistical Supply Area Anaconda. Anaconda is what we called it. That was its uh, its call sign. And it wasn't safe by any means, but it was definitely a more secure area because um, we were stationed there. So essentially, our job was, if, if you kind of think of like what a what a military base would look like with the fence and everything. All the surrounding area outside of that, like all the little towns and and little hovels and all the little bergs that kind of surrounded the base, our unit was responsible for securing that. You know, we would, you know, conduct patrols and, 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 you know, try to just ferry out the bad guys and keep them from shooting mortars and stuff onto the base. So uh, without boring you too much about all, all of that, essentially, like I said, it was it was it wasn't safe, but it was definitely more secure than some of the other areas that our, our sister battalions ended up going to. You know, we we lost a few soldiers, you know, when I was over there and a couple of my friends, uh, you know, they, they died. But um, we definitely saw a lot less casualties than some of the other battalions that we ended up going over there with, you know, so. All in all, you know, it could have been worse. Yeah, yeah, no, and I love your attitude, and I'm not going to, like, pick at individual threads of certain parts of this because it's none of my business, but I do want to focus on uh, something you just said because it it is relevant to me, which is when someone you know passes, um, whether or not it's in the military or not, it doesn't really matter, but, like, when you're there in that situation, like, do you have time to grieve and think about it, or is it better to, like, wait and hold that off? Whenever one of our soldiers would die, you know, um, it was obviously a big deal. And the three soldiers that I had that did die, you know, obviously all the soldiers were all very close. Me me as an officer, um, not so much as with the other, with the enlisted guys, with all the privates and the sergeants and stuff. Um, They kind of have their own little community. Uh, But they're super tight knit. And these guys are going out every day with the same dudes. They're their buddies. They're watching each other's backs. Everything they do, whether it's going on patrol or going to the cafeteria or going to the gym, for that entire year, they're just living with each other. And that's they're all they got. And then so when, when something terrible like that happens, it's it's hard on everyone, especially those guys. You know, I took it hard, you know, just because – I'm 21 years old, and now all of a sudden, I have these other dudes that are my same age, and they've, they're they're gone, and that's just not something that you know, no no more people, you know, no one's prepared for that, you know, that combat thing, and uh, so it's rough and it's really hard, and there is some time to grieve. You know, we had memorial ceremonies and all that. But at the end of the day, you know, if, if guys need time off, they take, they definitely took time. But at the end of the day, you know, we still got a job to do. And, you know, there's, there's only so much that you can do. There's only so much time that you can take, which, you know, it kind of, I, I, I hate the saying, but, you know, it is what it is, you know. Yeah, no, I mean, that's why I wanted to interview for this podcast is I think that we – talk an enormous amount in this country about issues around this, but we don't talk about this. And I think, uh, I don't think any answer you're going to give is going to change my opinion of what I said, which is we're a country, there's many countries and we have a standing military and we need one. So it's not, my questions aren't designed to encourage or discourage someone. It's more that I want all of us to think about the pathology of all this. So with that said, uh, you know, the, the big, big question of the podcast is, uh, what do you think happens when you die? And uh, just a little twist for you. Uh, I would be curious if that changed before, during, or after your service. I was Catholic, you know, grew up going to church every Sunday, you know, altar boy. I went to Catholic high school. Um, so that's how I was raised. But then I, I can't I can't really point to the exact moment, but, you know, there was just a point where I was, I, I just thought, you know, this, I don't know about all this stuff. You know what I'm saying? Like, I, I didn't really 
buy into it wholehearted. I wasn't, I, I was never really religious, so to speak. I just kind of went through the motions, I guess. Um, so I don't know if it was, you know, when I graduated high school and then went off to college. Uh, but yeah, I just like stuff going to church. You know, I, I didn't, I didn't really care about none of that. Um, so at some point around there, late teens, early twenties, I just decided, you know, that's it. You know, it's, it's kind of a dead over scenario. You know, there's no, there's no afterlife. There's no nothing. You know, we just return to the dirt and, uh, and that's that. But, um, I know when I went right before we deployed, you know, I decided, you know, I'm going to go to church and I went to church before we deployed. And then all throughout the deployment, you know, we have a chaplain assigned to us. And, uh, you know, I would talk to the chaplain and I'd go to, sometimes I'd go to services over there whenever they'd have them. And then when I got back from Iraq, I went to church again, kind of as like a, hey, there's someone there, appreciate you. Thanks for, thanks for looking out. And then, uh, <laughs> that's cool. That was about it. That was the last time I think I've been to church other than, yeah, I, I mean, so, but now, especially with that, I have, I have a, a six year old daughter. You know, I, I do see that there are definitely some aspects to religion that are beneficial, whether or not you believe or not, you know, just the, the whole morality of, of being religious, you know, it, it's a good thing. And my wife is, she was raised very religious. So we're not, so we're kind of doing a little bit of it with, with our kid. And I, I, I can see some, some good out of it. I, I, I appreciate it. So I don't know. I think, I think there is, there, there's a possibility, you know, I, I'm not, I guess what I'm trying to say is I'm not so much a, I don't know, is that, would you call it an agnostic? Nihilist is there's nothing. Agnostic is I'm waiting open-mindedly. Atheist is there's no God, which is like a little different from nihilism. Um, Cause you can still believe that there's something to the universe, but not specifically um, God and be an atheist. I do believe that the fact that, you know, we exist on this little freaking rock in the middle of everything, you know, it, it's pretty remarkable. You know, it's, it, you know, I, I tend to skew a little bit more towards the sciencey end of belief. I guess you could say, but, you know, just, just the fact that we are here sitting, you know, on opposite sides of the country, talking into these little computers, you know, in our ears and recording something to put on ones and zeros. It's pretty remarkable. And, uh, I don't know. Well, so it sounds to me like you're speaking about like the profoundness of existence. Um, and it sounds like you're seeing that more and more as you get older. And like, uh, one of the questions I was going to ask you is did the birth of your daughter, change that but I, I think it's pretty safe to say it did so I'm, I'm more curious like with all these profound things you just mentioned technology the earth spinning all this like randomness um what do you think actually is going to happen like when you die like do you think you become you return to a part of that or i mean i know you've kind of said you don't think anything but i'm just curious like when pushed by yourself or by me even uh what what would be your best guess i mean right now you know hold a gun to my head i would probably say you know when we die and then we're buried down into the ground that's kind of you know i i don't think that there is a a a you know an afterlife necessarily you know now hey you know if when i kick it you know and i, I open my eyes and it's all bright and it's all cool and everything all everyone's there hey that's kind of a bonus you know what i'm saying but um i, I don't necessarily believe that no, that's cool. I, I respect everything you're saying. And I, and I want to tie it back into the military thing. I have two quick questions about it. And then I want to move on to a different subject. Um, one, uh, do you think it's better to have your opinion to be a soldier? Or do you think it's better to really, really, really believe in an afterlife to be a soldier? I, I honestly, you know, I've met plenty of soldiers throughout throughout my I don't know, six years in the army and then the National Guard. And I don't think there's a difference. I don't think it matters. Um, I met plenty of guys that, you know, were either, you know, ah, screw, screw God, all that stuff is hocus pocus. And plenty of dudes that were super religious, you know, went to church every week, you know, wore their rosaries and, you know, or their necklaces with the crosses and said their prayers. And, you know, I don't think either, I don't think it's, uh, has any direct, you know, effect on whether or not you're like an effective soldier or not i don't i don't think you know as long as you know there's there's so many other things that would determine that but i don't think necessarily having a uh a religious aspect to it you know i don't think that would matter 
And then my only other question related to service is if you had had your daughter at the time, would you have tried to not like actively serve in Iraq or would you still have gone full swing ahead? Yeah, if I had a kid then, well, at the end of the day, it's not up to me. Um, big army's going to say, hey, you're going over here, you know, and that <laughs> is what it is. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, yeah, uh, I, it definitely would have been a lot harder to go, you know, to, to, to not see her for a year. Actually, I ended up being a year and a half. But, yeah, so, yeah, but, you know, army's going to do what you're going to have to do whatever the army says until you can get out. Yeah, no, and I appreciate your, I mean, you're just great to talk to, and uh, we don't have, like, infinite time, so I'm going to shift the subject. You're currently now uh, working in parole, which is another, like, pretty, like, not popular and also really not discussed topic. As a matter of fact, if I didn't know you personally, I don't think I would have ever met and or talked to anyone in this field. So I'm curious, it's the same kind of theme of death with it, but, like, um, my, my question now is, like, almost entirely the opposite, which is, the point of parole is rehabilitation. These people are expected to be quote unquote rehabilitating as they come out of prison. And then your job is to enforce their rehabilitation. And you can correct me whatever I said wrong and just to check in on them and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious, like how does that affect your sense of humanity? Because we just talked about like the bigness of it all. And we're floating on a thing and zeros and ones talking across computers and you have a beautiful daughter and you saw heroes in battle, but you also knew that the enemy hated you and wanted to kill you. So what, what can you transfer that experience and now talk about parole a little bit? Sure. So, and, and let me tell you, I was the same way, you know, unless you had a family member or some, unless you know someone that like, you know, committed some kind of crime and ended up going to jail and then was released on parole. Yeah. No one has any idea what the heck parole is. Um, but no, I, I definitely, so the nature of this job is, you know, when, whenever you know, someone gets out of jail and they have some time left on their sentence, they have to be supervised in the community, you know, and our job would be to, you know, assist in their reentry into the community, you know, hopefully being able to provide them some sort of uh, services or at least pointing them in the right direction of the services that they require. The example, you know, definitely, you know, drug and alcohol treatment, mental health treatment, you know, those are the, the big ones that we always use. A lot of guys get in trouble and, and girls, um, but a lot of them, you know, got drug abuse issues and it's pretty rampant. You know, everyone's familiar with the opioid epidemic and especially with the mental health, there's lots of people that have it. So, you know, that that's our biggest thing, trying to get people with, paired up with the right services and yeah we just are to uh monitor them and uh you know and uh, at the end of the day enforce the conditions of their parole um um but as far as is it my, my views on uh what was it how did how did you ask like my views on the humanity or, or something yeah yeah i'm just curious like because i mean look i talk to you every day so i i know like more than what I'm letting on as a host. But um, like I said, I mean, the, this is supposed to be like this grandiose moment in someone's life where they went through the system and they come out and they're, this is their big chance to return to society. At least that's what I was sold as a kid. So Sure. So I'll just say most people that are on parole, you know, are, do, are doing the right thing. Most people don't cause problems. Most people are going out there, you know, committing new crimes and victimizing more people and, and most of the most you know guys and gals on supervision they just want to be left alone they just want to do their thing and then every now and then their stinking po shows up hey you know what are you doing how's everything going are you working and we just want to just check in on them make sure that they're doing fine they're not causing any problems with the family or the community and then we just kind of go on our way but you know there's always that small percentage of Dudes are just going to do whatever the heck they want to do. And, you know, that's kind of how we, uh, you know, just got to sometimes you got to lay down the lay down the law, so to speak, you know, and do do whatever we need to do to, you know, protect the community and protect everyone else. But uh, it's it's unfortunate that, you know, us and many other law enforcement, you know, police and or whoever, you know, but we especially with parole. 100% of the people that we deal with every day are criminals and they've done bad stuff, you know, some worse than others, but at the end of the day, they've all broken the law. They've all done stupid things. And it's, it's a shame because it tends to color people's perspectives. Like, 
like when I'm not at work, I just had this tendency to just, oh, everyone's bad. Humanity has a general badness. You know, there's, there's not a lot of just great, good people out there. Everyone's done stupid stuff. Everyone's going to do stupid things. Everyone's going to try to take advantage of people. And that's just kind of, you just, that's just kind of the way the job for some people can just hammer you down a little bit. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, yeah. No, I think, I, I mean, you're, you not only are you making a lot of sense, but you, I hear the like compassion behind it. Like, like you, and actually I should say this now, like when I met you in college, you were just instantly one of those like really nice people. You have like kind eyes and a nice disposition and you're, you're still like a tough dude. Obviously you went into the military or parole officer, but it doesn't take away from that. You have a very kind, ge gentle nature to you. And so I'm glad that you've been serving in the military and I'm glad that you do the work you do, but it's also hard. It's hard to watch you. I, I'm not going to say get jaded because it's the way you describe it. It's not jaded. It's, it's, you see some real reality that a lot of us are, are hidden from. And also I'm a, I'm a bleeding heart person, but I know that like by the time you go to jail, jail, you've usually had more than one chance. Not always, not always. But, um, so I, I know that like you're dealing with a lot of like seeing like human pathology and what people do when they're presented with rules and stuff. So I will switch to a much lighter topic to kind of end the interview, which is um, back to spirituality and all that. Um, you definitely answered the question, what do you think happens when you die? And you answered it very well. I would like to know though, what is like the deepest, most profound spiritual experience you can think of in your life? Like what's a time where like you were just kind of in awe and you were just like, holy crap, I can't really explain that. Wow. Well, I can tell you pretty recently, one, one of my best friends, you know, he, he went through this really really tough time with his family like two of his daughters died they they were born with like a pretty extremely rare condition and you know their life expectancy was really low but you know he was, he was one of my best friends that i worked with he was my road dog and uh you know i i do anything for the guy and then um yeah one when they died you know i went to the service and everything and he and his wife and his other daughters, you know, got hats off to them. They're also super spiritual, very religious. And just watching them being able to cope with this loss. Like, I, I couldn't even imagine what it would be like losing two of my children when they were 10 and I think 12, something around there, you know, you really can't wait for not knowing. But <laughs> um, just watching them, like going to these services, just seeing the, the the strength and the resolve that they have together um as a family individually and especially as a community in that church like there was a lot of folks there and i was the, just i don't know it was just a handful of months ago uh when when the, the when his other daughter passed and i i remember sitting there and i i it was, it's so funny i remember sitting there watching everything and hearing the uh the i guess the, the sermon by the by the the, the the i don't know i don't know what you call him the preacher or pastor whatever he is whatever his title is but just hearing that and just watching everybody and seeing that it, it really something, <laughs> something inside me i was like oh man that's pretty freaking rad you know and like like it, was, it almost made me jealous for a little bit i was like oh dude that's like what a good feeling, you know, or what a, what a nice thing to have that, that community, that, that, that camaraderie with these strangers usually, and just on that common belief, you know, you know, and it's of, of, of hope of, of for, for something in the future or that you, you know, when someone passes, you'll see them again in the afterlife. And I was like, I, I don't know, I admired it, you know, and like I said, it was probably a little bit, oh man, you know, I wish I had that. You know, so, you know, I, 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 it really, it, it moved me, you know, being there and I was like, oh my gosh, this is, this is, uh, it, it was pretty, uh, it was pretty remarkable seeing that, you know, so. No, that's really cool. And that's really special. And, uh, I think that actually does a really nice job of tying everything together. So, um, I always give my guests the last, uh, question i don't even ask a question i just say hey you got the floor the internet is or is not listening so um whatever you want to say please go at it all right well don't do drugs kids um <laughs> go talk to your recruiter the military is always looking for fine upstanding hard-working young men and women no i'm just you know just don't be a butthead you know just treat everyone good you know 
that's about it. But uh, it's been a pleasure talking with you, though. Yeah. Uh, don't be a butthead, everyone. I think that's definitely the best note to end on. And that's also a great way to put another nail in the coffin. So again, thank you to Brian Fallick, all the way from Bethlehem, north of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Uh, you seriously were so awesome in this interview. And I'm uh, definitely going to be thinking about a lot of the things you said. Um, thank you again. And to everyone listening at home, uh, we really appreciate the loyalty and support. So if you want to help the podcast, the best way you can help us is to subscribe and then maybe leave a positive review on Apple. And then other than that, just please tell a friend and head over to MikeyOp.com and sign up for the weekly essay. And once again, my name is Mike Oppenheim. You have been listening to Coffin Talk and we will see you soon. Let your limb and I sing you are my moon.